Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. This is the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton. And in this episode, we're looking at how you can change piano methods when you've already started in one method book. You can find the accompanying article that goes along with this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 164, or if you're not a member, colorfulkeys.ie slash 164. Welcome, beautiful teachers. So if there has ever been an episode that was difficult to briefly summarize in that little intro bit that you just heard, this is it. What I'm describing here is when a student has started a method already and it's just not working. So that's what we're talking about today, is when you want to make that move. And many teachers will ask about this I've seen many questions come up about it over time because the concern is often that this parent already has this method book and you're going to be asking them to buy another. But there are many other difficulties around this area, so that's why I wanted to dedicate a whole episode to it. So it's about when a student is in a method book already, how can we change to a different method? Let's start by talking about why you'd want to do that. So one example of that commonly comes up is that a student is a transfer student. That's why we're putting this in transfer student month. So your student has already begun with another teacher and they started in, I'm just going to pick at random here, Alfred. Okay, so they're in Alfred basic, let's say, and they come to you and they're halfway through 1B. Not even sure if there is a 1B. I almost hope there isn't because I'm using this example at random. This is not trying to pick on Alfred. Okay, so let's say they're in Alfred 1B and they come to you as a transfer student and you do not use Alfred. You're not really comfortable with it and it doesn't align with the way you teach. So the things just feel like they're in the wrong order for the way that you normally teach your students. And so you would prefer to put them into, let's again pick at random, music tree okay so you love to use music tree they're in alfred how can you switch them over and should you switch them over but another common issue that comes up for teachers is you started them in another method so say you use several most teachers i believe should have several methods in their toolkit at least a few that they commonly use so let's say that you started them in piano pronto And you've decided now that it's not the best fit for them and you would prefer to switch them to Piano Adventures, which you also use. How can you switch them over? That's almost even trickier because if you're looking at it from a financial point of view, because you have to go to the parents and say, I was wrong. This is the wrong book for them. Okay, so I brought up the financial thing because many teachers ask about it from that perspective, but I honestly don't think that should be any factor in your consideration here. And it's not because I don't care about parents' finances. It's because we're talking about, let's say, 10, 20 quid. Okay? 20 quid max. $20, 20 euro, whatever. That's the maximum they're going to pay for the new set of method books. Am I right? So let's say it's 20 euro. They are investing how much with you on lessons? And they spend how much on an instrument? If that 20 euro is going to get them a better lesson experience, is going to make their kiddo progress faster, enjoy the lessons more, interact better, be more motivated, whatever reason you want to make the switch, I'm sure you've considered it. So that is obviously worth it in the context of the investment parents put into piano lessons. So I want to get that out of the way first. Please do not dissuade yourself from making this change just because of parents having to shell out another few quid. If you explain to them from the right perspective, they will be fine with it. Having said that, this is a lot simpler if you're like me and you do all-inclusive fees where you just buy all the books for the student and you absorb that cost into your fees. So I would recommend making that switch if it's something that appeals to you because I certainly love doing it that way in my studio. 
All right, but that's not really what this episode is about. It's not about the finances or how you buy books for your students or whether they buy them themselves, okay? That was just almost a tangent before we've even begun. I hope you bore with me for it. Because it's important to get that out of the way. Now let's talk about how we choose the right method for them to go to and where we're going to place them. So it's not always a simple question to be able to answer which method book is going to work for this student. So let's go through four different matchmaking factors, as I've called them. Let's start with skills. So whether this is a transfer student or a transfer from yourself to yourself, your student is going to have some weaker areas. Because they're a human. We all have some weaker areas too. So without even some catastrophic transfer student situation, they're still going to have some things that they're better at than others, because we all do. Going alongside that, many method books are stronger on one aspect than another. So you're going to want to take this into consideration when choosing and fitting a student with a method book. Let's say your student is weak on rhythm. Well, you're going to want to pick out a method book that takes a slow enough pace with rhythm for them to be able to work on it, and also that emphasizes rhythm enough. So you have a lot of different factors there. Or let's say you think this student would really benefit from more improv, but you're having trouble fitting that into your lessons and you would be more comfortable if it was integrated into a method. So maybe that is a factor, right? Or maybe it's about an interval reset and you need a book that is strongly focused and really hones in on intervallic reading above all else. So if you're not sure where your students' gaps are, I really recommend checking out our student sleuth. That's inside the Vibrant Music Teaching membership. If you're a member, just go to the member dashboard and you'll see a link to the student sleuth there. And you can assess where your student is tracking in terms of different skill acquisition. The next factor here in your method book matchmaking is your student's goals. So your student's goals should have a really big role to play if they're older. If they're younger, in general, you can guide where you're going to put them, right? Because their goals are not as fixed. And yeah, the amount of parental involvement is maybe an alternate factor that you could consider there. But they are slightly older, which a lot of transfer students will be. I really think this should be basically your number one or your starting spot is what does this student want from lessons? What do they want to learn? Where do they want to go? Why are they studying piano? If your student is joining you because they really want to learn to play like Ed Sheeran, to sit here and play piano, whatever. <laughs> if they really want to learn pop music, you're not going to win anything, any piano teaching races, if there was one. You're not going to win by putting them into a method which is entirely classical arrangements or something like that. So you do need to take into consideration their goals. That doesn't mean we're not going to broaden out what we introduce to them, but we have to gain their trust first. And if this student is new to you, then you need to start in a method book that they're actually going to feel like you took into consideration what their goals are. The next factor then is the style of the method book. What do I mean by style? This isn't about any pedagogical thing or the musical genre. It's about the actual look and layout of the book. And that can be an important factor, especially if you have a student with some kind of learning difference or special need or just a particular way of doing things, a particular personality, it can be really important that you have a certain style or another. So some students would respond really well to things like the work of Andrea and Trevor Dow, who do all those comic book styles. But many students will find this completely distracting and will do much better if they need a really minimal black and white, not too fussy style with something like Piano Pronto, right? So take into consideration the look of the method book, because it could matter more than you think it would. And then the last big factor here is the level. Why did I leave this till last? 
I love to do last because it's the hardest and therefore it shouldn't really help you choose the method book. You should choose the method book first and then try and find the best level to put them into. Some method book publishers have charts and things like that where you can correlate this method with that level and where they would end up. But honestly, while those can be useful as a starting point, as a tool, it's not going to give you a full picture because every method book progresses through concepts differently. So one method book moves really fast through all the different notes and uses the full staff, right? And another method book introduces quavers right from the first page and the, you know, versus that method book which doesn't. So there's always going to be different factors and different variation. We know that, right? We know music is not that simple. There isn't one way to work through all these concepts. So keep that in mind when you look at things like correlation charts. If it says that level two is like level three in such and such a method, mm, Take it with a grain of salt, because for your student, that might not be true, because they might have gelled well with one concept in a certain method book that happens to be the concept that moves more slowly in the other method book, right? So, yeah, (laughs) it can be a confusing minefield, which is why I would like to encourage you to go back rather than forward. I know it might not be your first instinct. You want to bolster the students confident you feel bad putting them back a level honestly most students won't notice that they've gone back a level and as long as you can just explain to them listen leveling systems do not work the same in different method books so we're starting from this level you can even mention to them if you think if you're very sure that it's going to be easy in the beginning stages you can tell them oh we're just going to fly through the initial chapters to get used to the way this method book looks and works And then things will slow down later on. But we want to get off to a flying start and just get used to the format. That might not always be a good idea if you're not sure they're going to fly through it because then they'll end up feeling bad that they're moving slowly. So maybe, maybe not on that front. But if you are uncertain about the level, I really do encourage you to go backwards. So let's say they're in, I don't know, Piano Adventures and they've just finished level 2A. You might be tempted to say to yourself, "Mm, maybe I can push them up to Piano Safari 3 when I move them across. I would not do that. I would put them back to the beginning of 2 and let them fly. If they're going to go really quickly through the initial stages of level 2, great, wonderful. That'll only reinforce certain concepts and bolster their self-esteem. They're not going to feel bad for going back to the start of 2. That's something we're much more aware of as teachers than students will ever be. They're going to feel much worse if they jump into three and it just feels impossible. Because honestly, in that case, it would. It would feel so tough. The notation is so much smaller in Piano Safari. The music might look the same level to some teachers. But if you actually dig into the technique required and the coordination required, It's a lot more classical in nature, and so it requires a lot more coordination, which many students will find challenging. So when in doubt, go easy, go backwards. (laughs) They won't be bothered as much as you think they will. But there's another side to this. Aside from picking the right method and putting them in the right level and worrying about the finances, here's what I want to encourage you to do. Take your time. Don't put them in a method right away. If we're talking about transfer students, let them join your studio and stay with you for a month, two months at least, before you put them into a book. You don't need a book right away. I know it might be more comfortable or maybe easier for you to do that, but it's not easier in the long run and it's not the best thing for that student. So I want to encourage you to start with some off book other stuff before you get to a method book if you're going to be putting them in a method book at all. A great place to start with this, in my opinion, would be our online from the outset plans. This will give you a simple grab and go option and you don't have to be teaching online and you don't have to be working with a beginner to use these plans, despite their name. That is why they were created, right? They're for online lessons from the very beginning of lessons. 
but we've used them a lot with transfer students in my studio and it works great because you've got a mixture of games and beginner rote pieces that focus on the patterns on the piano and other fun interactive things that help you get to know the student. So it's a great place to start. And because they're rote pieces, nobody knows whether they're beginner or too easy or whatever. Even a student who's much further along, yeah, they might feel like, oh, these pieces are a little bit silly, but you can giggle through them. You don't have to take it too seriously together. You can talk to them about the fact that you're just getting used to each other, and so you're starting off with this silly piece if you need to. But yeah, online from the outset would be a simple grab and go option. But let me talk you through the three elements that I think are useful in there so that you can build your own plan if that's what you want to do or if your student is a bit further along than their first couple of years, let's say. So the most important thing for me that you include in your new transfer student lessons is games. And that's not just because I love games in general. It's also because games allow you to assess where a student is at without testing them or quizzing them or it feeling like a high pressure situation. So a few different areas that I suggest you look at through games with your new student are number one, intervals. For this, you might use games such as piano interval or interval, schminterval, sprinterval, or both. Those would really look at separate sides of intervals and they would be great in combination. Then you'd also want to look at note names. So you could use something like Double or Nothing, which would be great. I love Double or Nothing for this because it helps you gauge not just the student's ability to name notes, but their confidence naming notes. And then Swoop at Sight because that would bring it back to the piano. Again, this is all listed out in the article. So if you want to check this in written form later, if you're driving right now and you're like, what? What is she saying? How am I going to remember this? Don't worry, it's all written out for you. Just go to vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 164 when you're finished listening, okay? But Swoop It's Side is great because they're actually playing them on the piano. So that will give you that association, which can often be a tripping point for many transfer students is they know the note names, but they don't know where they are on the piano. You suddenly discover several months down the line. Then you'd want to check in with terms as well. So something like term boggin or pit stop or one of our other general term games that has multiple levels would be great there. For rhythm, I would suggest any exercises or several different exercises or games from Rhythm in 5, which is our rhythm course. For ear training, something like the hexatonic pattern cards would be great to get them singing. And sidestep solfa would be super as well to work on solfa if you use that in your studio. It's a really fun interactive one and it really doesn't feel like a quiz even if they've never encountered sulfur before they can jump straight into it. And then I'd also check on their general staff knowledge because even if they're like several years in some have missed over or forgotten a lot of the basics of the way the staff is set up and that can really trip them up later on. So something like staff soul which is a puzzle where they build together pieces of the staff And or musical cadets, which is where they act out different things like double bar lines, braces, that kind of thing. These are just a starting point, of course. We have tons of games. So if you find that one of those or some other concept is something that your student really needs more attention on, then that's where you hone in, right? So you pick out more games in that area where you play the games on repeat, you lend them to the student and they play them at home and develop in that area in the beginning of lessons and beyond. Then the other essential that I'd say you should include in these lessons before you start the method book is some kind of rote repertoire. Rote repertoire is great at this stage of a transfer student's journey because number one, they might not have learned any pieces in this way before, so you're improving all of those memory skills that they might not have. It's also a wonderful way to assess how they are with piano geography which is something which I found many transfer students don't have well enough, right? So they haven't really got the keys down cold or they just can't move around the piano well enough. So rote repertoire is great for that. And it helps you to see their technique in action as well, which is really, really valuable. Because they're not focused on reading, you can really see how do they play when they already know something, when they can already play the piece, how do they do it? 
So if you want to get started with rope pieces, but you don't want to use the ones from online from the outset, I suggest either Piano Safari's Pattern Pieces 1 or Pattern Pieces 2, or RopeRepertoire.com, which is Samantha Coates's pieces, and you can buy them as individual packs. So both of those would be great places to start with your students. If you're unsure which one of those to choose, and you're new to rote teaching, first of all, definitely search the site for rote, and you'll come across several resources where I talk about how to teach by rote more in depth and why you would want to do it. And then if you're torn still between pattern pieces from Piano Safari and Rote Repertoire by Samantha Coates, I would err on the side of younger students being in pattern pieces and older students being in Rote Repertoire, although you can definitely use both with both demographics. Alongside that, I would also have the student explore some general pieces from your library. Now, caveat here, please don't do this for more than five minutes out of the lesson because students will have certain connotations when it comes to sight reading and it's not always positive, so definitely don't let this take up too much lesson time. But if you have various books on hand, do get them to do a little bit of reading so you can start to see how they do with that. And I would especially encourage you to play duets with them. So if you have method books where there's a teacher duet part or just general duets, whether they're evenly leveled or teacher plus student levels, either will do. Just play along with them so it feels more fun and you get to see really how they do with sight reading when you play duets because you can feel when they're going away from the pulse and you can keep them going, right? So they can't go back and fix mistakes and all that stuff. It's just about getting into the flow and reading in the moment. After that, you might place them in a method book and you can use the suggestions for how to find the right method for them and the right level for them. Or maybe you decide they have a method book already, uh, whether you gave it to them or someone else did. And after this jaunt into rote repertoire and little bits of sight reading and lots of games, you decide, you know what, we can work with that method book and we can supplement to help them achieve more success until the end of that book or that series. That is absolutely a viable option for many students, especially if the method book is, you're not against it, right? There's nothing offensive to you about it. It's just got some stuff that's missing for you. It's very easy to supplement these things. If you want a general musicianship supplement, a great place to look is either Tiny Finger Takeoff or the Piano Power Booster series inside Vibrant Music Teaching. So Tiny Finger Takeoff, if you're not familiar, is for younger students and Piano Power Booster 1, 2 and 3 are for older students or come after that for, for the younger students who have been through Tiny Finger Takeoff. So those are supplements. They're meant to go alongside a method book anyway. They're designed to be used that way and they make it more of a holistic musicianship journey. So they're including improvisation, technique work, rhythm, oral work, and theory, so that your students can, you can be sure that they're doing everything, right? That they're doing all of the things and that their education is well-rounded. So that would be a great place to look. You want to supplement with a bit of another method, that's another great way to go. So for example, Piano Safari sight reading cards alongside another method to help them get used to the intervallic approach to sight reading. Or maybe you have a favorite method book like Piano Adventures, which is split up into four different books per level, and you just really want to cover the technique part of that. So you just add in that one little technique book. I mean, I think they're like, what are they, like $7? Just add that into the other method book that they're doing, right? So you can mix and match if you think that's going to be a better approach. There are no rules here, so make it work for you and your student, and as long as you're having fun and learning music together, you are doing well. I would love to hear if you've ever switched a student's method and what you found difficult or useful about it, or any tips you have for other teachers. Please do add your comments under the article that goes along with this episode. It's at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 164 or colorfulkeys.ie slash 164. And I would love to hear from you in our Facebook group too. That's the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers Group. I'll see you over there. One of the awesome benefits for Vibrant Music Teaching members is that they get an exclusive member magazine every month. 
This magazine brings together our blog articles in a way that is digestible and super actionable. If you want to become a member and get the magazine as well as all the other benefits, you can go to vmt.ninja to sign up.